Good afternoon and welcome to our hearing where we will learn more about tax increment financing, also referred to as TIFs, and discuss TIF related items that will be on the city, Columbus City Council agenda for final consideration on Monday, December 6, 2021. I am Councilmember Emmanuel Remy, Chair of the Economic Development Committee, and I want to recognize uh, our team here today who put this on. Um, thank you to Jeff Carter, uh, Mark Carter, Lucy Frank, the development team. And so uh, we're joined this afternoon by Michael Stevens, the director of the Department of Economic Development, who will provide the presentation this afternoon. Um, also speaking this afternoon, we have Amanda Hofsis, the assistant vice president of planning, architecture and real estate for the Ohio State University. Steve Campbell, the owner and principal of North Star Policy and Project Development, and Molly Gwynn, the partner with Isaac Wiles and Burkholder LLC and attorney to Pulte and Harmony Development. As previously mentioned, on, on Monday, December 6, there will be seven TIF items on the agenda for Council's consideration, and they are related to the following projects or, and or areas the Ohio State University Innovation District, Sugar Farms and Renner South, Crown Point, Harlem Walnut, Arena District, Wineland Park 40 C TIF, and the PNC Gilbert Madison White Haynes project. This afternoon, Director Stevens will provide us with an overview of TIFs, what they are and why they are used. Then we will proceed into discussing each of the seven TIFs previously mentioned. Before I get started, I want to remind everyone that this hearing is currently live on YouTube and Facebook, and it is also live and being recorded for rebroadcast on CTV, Columbus's government television channel three. The rebroadcast schedule is available at www.columbus.gov. Without further ado, I would like to turn the floor over to Director Mike Stevens to begin the presentation. Director, the floor is yours. Chair Remy, thank you for having me here this afternoon and thanks to you and your team for making this happen. Uh, this is the third year in a row that we've done a public hearing on tax increment financing um, and I think it's important that we continue to talk about this critical economic development tool that we have utilized with great success in our community. So thank you again for scheduling this hearing. Tax increment financing is a public financing tool available to local governments in Ohio to finance public infrastructure, improvements that support commercial, commercial and industrial development, and in certain circumstances, residential purposes. TIFs are authorized and established through TIF legislation passed by local government. A TIF works by allowing the increase in assessed value of an improvement to real property to be exempt from real property taxation, unless the improvement is used or to be used for residential purpose. In order to TIF exempt a residential improvement, a study must be performed perform prior to passage of the TIF legislation to determine if the TIF is, TIF is located in a blighted area of an impacted city or if the TIF exemption must be granted under Ohio Revised Code 5709.40C. The property owners instead make payment in lieu of taxes or pilots in the amount equal to only the increase in property taxes generated by the improvement. The pilots are distributed to the local government and deposited in a TIF fund to be used to pay for the public infrastructure improvements defined within the TIF legislation that benefit and or serve the TIF area or district. It is important to note that the property taxes on the real property values existing before the enactment of the TIF or the base value continues to be, to, continues to be collected and distributed to the taxing entities that levied them. Disbursements from the TIF fund may reimburse the entity, whether it be a private developer, a lender, and or the city that finance the public infrastructure improvements made on behalf of or by the city. Over time, as TIF revenues become available, if the TIF continues to generate revenue beyond the initial public infrastructure improvement costs, the TIF net revenues remain with the city and can be used for additional TIF eligible public infrastructure improvements needed to spur de private development or to maintain the sufficiency of the public infrastructure improvements benefiting and or serving the TIF area or district. 
In Columbus, we have histor historically been authorized, uh, we've, we've created TIFs that have historically been authorized by two statutes in the Ohio Revised Code, 5709.40 TIFs and 5709.41 TIFs. .40 TIFs must be used to pay for public infrastructure improvements such as public roads, highways, water, and sewer lines, sidewalks, land acquisitions, environmental remediation, stormwater and flood remediation projects, enhancement of public waterways, public parks, and parking structures with the exception of TIFs established under Ohio Revised Code 5709-40C may be used for residential purposes too. Point four one TIFs are also known as urban redevelopment TIFs are able to be used to pay for the public infrastructure improvements eligible under point four zero TIFs as well as private improvements authorized by the legislative body in acting the legislation. In order to create a point four one TIF, the city or municipality must be or have been in the chain of title of the property prior to passage of the TIF legislation. Changes to the state law in 2021 allows both the point four zero TIF and point four one TIF exemptions to commence with either the tax year specified in the TIF legislation after the effective date of the TIF legislation in which the exempted improvement first appears on the tax list and duplicate of real and public utility property, and or three, the exempted improvement value exceeds a specific amount, or four, when a specific improvement construction is completed. We get asked a lot of how do TIFs impact our local school districts. Within the City of Columbus school districts, the City of Columbus creates a non-school TIF. This means that the school district will continue to receive the amount of property taxes that would have been payable to the school district if there is no TIF exemption enacted by the local government. Any TIFs created where the exemption affects the property tax revenue to a school district requires a compensation agreement negotiated with and approved by the school boards where the TIF area or district is located. The maximum term of a TIF exemption is 30 years and the maximum percentage of a TIF exemption is 100% if school district revenue is not affected by the TIF exemption. Or a compensation agreement is approved by the school district. Otherwise, the main term exemption percentage is 10 years at 75%. Typically, the city does 30 years at 100% because we continue to make the Columbus City Schools whole on their property tax. TIF can support both industrial, commercial, and residential development by aiding in the creation of location of new jobs that help increase the tax bases of the local government and school districts and levy agencies once the TIF exemption expires. We use these TIF taxes for social services benefiting the community and the creation of a new affordable and housing, uh, new affordable market rate housing units in the community leveraged by granting the TIF exemption. TIF exemption. TIF revenue support from the city encourages redevelopment to uh, blighted areas and brownfields and neighborhoods and the development and maintenance of public infrastructure. We work closely on an annual basis uh, through our Tax and Incentive Review Council and with our local developers to make sure that they're being held accountable for their commitments through the TIF legislation. We're required to report annually to the Ohio Department I'm sorry, the Ohio Development Services Agency and the city's Tax Incentive Review Council regarding compliance of all city TIFs. The uh, general authority for municipal TIFs was established by House Bill 1328 in 1976. As of 2020, there are approximately 1,260 260 active TIFs statewide. There are 242 TIF projects within Franklin County that has been reviewed by Turks in 2021. The first TIF in the city of Columbus was the Easton TIF, which was established in 1986. There are currently 88 TIFs within the city of Columbus as of November of 2021. Uh, that's a quick overview of the importance of this economic development tool. This is also part of a F, uh, FAQ sheet that the Department of Development has on its website for the public and, and community members to go and access and, and, and read. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions, as always. Thank you very much. Um, I don't have any questions right off the top of my head right now. So uh, I think we'll dive right into our speakers and uh, let them present. Let me uh, make sure I'm on the right page. 
Uh, the first speaker that we have this evening is the Ohio State University Innovation District. It's Amanda Hofsis. Amanda, are you available to speak? Yes, I'm here. Great. Good afternoon, Council Chair Remy and President Hardin, Council members. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak about the Ohio State University, uh, their Innovation District, TIF, proposed partnership. Uh, between the City of Columbus and Ohio State University that will have positive community outcomes for our city and our region. I'm going to share uh, just a short presentation with you today about this opportunity. Together we have a bold vision to realize uh, and implement what we believe will be a legacy development for the University, City of Columbus, and State of Ohio. When completed, the Innovation District will accommodate more than 10,000 jobs with an average salary of over $75,000 a year. We estimate more than $1.7 billion of new taxable value in infrastructure, or excuse me, in improvements uh, on the site. The discoveries and innovations that will occur within the district will drive new job markets in the region, attracting businesses looking to tap into the area's growing talent pipeline. This is an image of the Innovation District Plaza that we have planned um, as part of, it's a, it's a key component of the Innovation District. You can see a uh, outline of the Innovation District uh, today uh, and the plans we have for development. Some new construction is happening there now that is university related construction. Um, but today, much of this land has no access to uh, infrastructure, roadways or utilities. Um, and so uh, the purpose for this tip um, this is a 30-year TIF, non-school TIF, uh, will be to help support the construction of those public improvements, such as new sewer and water line that would be extended to this district, uh, roadways, bikeways, sidewalks throughout the district where none exist today, uh, utility extensions throughout the district that would open up uh, new areas for development, stormwater improvements, public transit infrastructure, this includes uh, future transit centers, uh, smart signalizations, et cetera, and public parking facilities throughout the site. The reason why this is important to the region is because it's about jobs and, and job growth and innovations uh, and new eco economies for the city of Columbus um, and really tapping into the pipeline of research and innovation happening at Ohio State and uh, the pipeline of new businesses being tr attracted to the city of Columbus and really taking advantage of this underutilized ground that is so well located in our city. Once we are able to extend these public infrastructure, uh, significant new improvements uh, will be developed. The densities here are, will be similar to that within the Arena District. The Arena District was about 75 acres, I believe, and this is uh, planned for more than 270 acres. All in all, we think this will generate um, uh, significant new jobs, like I said, 10 to 12,000 new jobs, um, significant new investment in infrastructure, um, leading to many new uh, partnerships in research innovation, new corporations growing and developing here in Columbus. Thank you again for letting me present and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Ms. Hofsis. I appreciate uh, your testimony today. There's certainly a lot of cranes over that way and, and uh, working diligently, lots of buildings going up as we speak. Do you have any comments or questions right now, Director? Thank you, uh, Chair Ramey. I would add that um, Ohio State has been a great partner in this effort. 
one of the things that we have uh, highlighted as our public policy priorities was to make sure that if we're using tools like this, um, we're seeing things like affordable housing being uh, included in the development mix, as well as their commitment to uh, utilizing um, minority and disadvantaged, uh, disadvantaged businesses. And so they have uh, stepped up to that and we appreciate that level of commitment. Uh, it's a great job creator. Uh, the one thing that we've talked about in the past and we'll talk about again is their steam rising effort that they are working with uh, the universities, working with um, Columbus City Schools as well as Columbus State to really pr provide opportunities for uh, our, our the students in the, in the school district now to see what, what opportunities in the, the um, innovation district for work for them in the future. So we, we appreciate that commitment from the university. Thank you very much. We also appreciate the uh, commitment to diversity as far as construction is concerned. And, you know, the, these are, despite the fact that the, it's going to ultimately lead to a lot of jobs uh, created in the innovation district, it's a lot of construction jobs at the moment as well. And, and, and the commitment to diversifying that workforce is, is um, important to us here on council. So, again, thank you so much for the testimony today. Next, we'll move on to um, Sugar Farms and Renner South. And with that, we have uh, Steve Campbell and Molly Gwynn. So I want to uh, turn the floor over to both of those and let them decide who's going to go first. I imagine it might be Steve. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank all of the members of City Council as well for their support of development matters and housing matters as our city continues to grow. And I especially want to thank Mayor Genther and Director Stevens for their work in partnership with uh, our team on developing sugar farms and Brenner South. I want to share a few highlights with you. So, um, about a year ago, we were at City Council uh, for our rezoning and, uh, and the authorization of an economic development agreement. And <clears throat> Just to remind you of a few of the highlights for our project, we uh, are investing in the city of Columbus. Um, we estimate that the total investment of our developments will be valued at $325 million. We're also playing a very important part in meeting the housing demand for the citizens of Columbus. Uh, we're gonna have 682 single family and empty nester homes, 196 townhomes and 220 multifamily homes. As you know, Mr. Chairman, this is this development is within the Big Darby Accord, and so there are some very important and special economic and ecological requirements on this project to make sure that we improve uh, the uh, environment out there as we develop these homes and uh, we've complied with the Big Darby Accord and we've also complied with the neighborhood plan, the Roberts Trade Plan. And in the end, in addition to bringing these homes to the city, uh, we are going to uh, improve the water quality in the Darby watershed. We're going to improve traffic safety and mobility and invest in new parks, trails, and a stream restoration in the area. Okay. In 2009, it's important to, to start by saying that um, TIFs are actually required in this uh, development and in this part of our city. Uh, and the background for that is in 2009, the city, the county, and others adopted resolutions to create a Darby Revenue Program. And what the communities agreed to was that each developer that came out here uh, would commit to $2,500 per unit uh, towards the revenue program, a new community authority that would have a, a minimum of five mills and a maximum of 10 mil charge to their development, and a 30-year non-school, non-fire TIF uh, for their development. All of this money to go to a revenue program to serve afford purposes and regional priorities. It's important to note that in the revenue program itself, um, it specifies that the um, TIF districts are expected to be the most important revenue generator uh, of the program. And we estimate in our 
uh, revenue program. TIF revenues will constitute 75% of our program funds. While that is a lot of money, it's important to note that the revenue program in the Darby uses less than 25% of the potential TIF revenues. We've exempted school and vocational uh, school tax levies. We've exempted fire levies in the township. And we've also exempted 5% of TIF revenues uh, so that they can uh, be maintained by county levy agencies. Now that we've established this uh, program, as the money goes into the program, we want to share a few of the improvements that we will invest in. The city agreement that was negotiated by Director Stevens and his department uh, and the revenue program will be fueled by TIFs and they will fulfill the Big Darby vision in this area. We're going to improve water quality by bringing centralized sewer and water to the area. We're going to introduce stormwater best management practices to improve the quality of water that are going into uh, the tributaries of the uh, Big Darby. And we're going to restore the clover growth, the Darby's most distressed stream. Providing connected green space is also a priority of the Darby Accord. And in our program, we're going to have 81 acres of new city parks. Our developments have 50% open space, and we have multi-use paths and public trails that are going to connect the park and other parks in the region. We're also going to address important traffic safety and mobility uh, issues in the area. One of the challenges in this area is traffic and the Hilliard Rome Renner intersection is Central Ohio's fifth highest crash intersection. The revenue program will provide funding towards a broader effort to uh, correct that problem and improve traffic safety in the area. The city also, uh, through leadership of, uh, of the development department and, and your, your committee and Chair Tyson, um, initiated a McKinley Trade and Mobility Initiative. We're the Western anchor of that. And uh, we also will, as mentioned before, have multi-use paths and public trails for public use. The program will, will help with all of those initiatives, but more importantly, over the whole 30 years, there will be tens of millions of dollars in additional resources raised by these developments uh, that the city will leverage for additional water quality, park land, and safety initiatives. And with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Mr. Campbell. Um, did Was Molly going to speak about this as well? Steve covered everything. Thank you. I, I'm happy to take, take any questions regarding the economic MOU or the documents themselves. You're there for moral support, right? Um, Director, would you like to uh, speak to this? Uh, I have nothing to add, Council Member. All right. Um, obviously, it's a big development out on the west side, and certainly uh, with housing being a dire need in the uh, Columbus, City of Columbus, we're, we're excited for this project to get off the ground and of course the improvements that will lead to um, some of the traffic congestion out there is very important as well. Um, next, I'll throw it back to the director to talk about the remaining projects um, that we have. And so, director, uh, floor thanks. Is yours again. Thank you, Chair Ramey. We've got five more projects where we'll be bringing some type of TIF legislation forward to Council next month, so I just wanted to give a quick highlight of those. Uh, first project is Crown Point. Uh, the West Broad Street TIF will be created to provide revenue that will further the conserver conservation and development policies outlined in the Big Darbany Revenue Program adopted by City Council in 2009, very similar to what we just heard about with the uh, Sugar Farm Project. Uh, Crown Point owns uh, approximately nine acres of property located at 5960 West Broad Street and it plans to invest $18 million to construct multifamily residential units. Uh, the property is located within the Big Darby watershed and is subject to the Big Darby Accord, which is an intergovernmental planning accord designed to protect the environmentally sensitive watershed. As part of the accord, um, I think 
Mr. Campbell covered this earlier, the Big Derby Revenue Program was developed to specifically develop, uh, to specify development driven revenue sources that would be used to protect environmental sources and manage development within the watershed. So that's the TIF, it's a per unit contribution from the developer and then charges associated with a new community authority. The city executed a development agreement with Crown Point in December of 2020, requiring them to participate in the Big Derby Revenue Programming program and outlining how program revenues generated by their development would be used to pay for Big Derby Accord purposes. This legislation will create the new West Broad Street TIF on the property pursuant to uh, Ohio Revised Code 5709.40B. Uh, so this is a .40 TIF and the new TIF will be subject to the allocations identified in the Big Derby Revenue Program as follows, 30 years non-school, um, it's within 30 year non-school TIF, 75% uh, of the TIF revenue will be dedicated to Big Derby Accord purposes, 20% of TIF revenue will be dedicated to regional improvements, and 5% of TIF revenue will go to the county levy agencies. This is based on the revenue program that the city and the county agreed to back in uh, approximately 2011 to make sure that we were uh, honoring our commitments around the Big Derby Accord. The next, do you have any questions with regards to the Crown Point project? If not, I'll go on, thank you. Um, the next project is we're calling Harlem and Walnut. The Harlem and Walnut TIF will be created to provide additional funding to pay for public improvements necessary to support continued growth to continued growth in the Northeast pay as we grow area. We know developers such as MI Homes, Pulte Homes, SW Luxury Apartments, and Walnut Land Holding LLC own approximately 227 acres of land in the Northeast pay as we grow area located at the intersection of Wal Walnut Street and Harlem Road. The developers plan to invest approximately $318 million to construct a maximum of over uh, 1,061 residential units on the property. Uh, ordinances 2932-2019 and 2934-2019 authorize pay as we grow payments with Pulte and Simonella Incorporated to finance regional public infrastructure improvements necessary for the development of the property. And the pay as we grow agreements identify three revenue sources to finance those improvements, the TIF, NCA charges, and per unit development contributions. This legislation would create a new Harlem Walnut TIF pursuant to Ohio uh, Revised Code 5709.40C, uh, covering a portion of the undeveloped property consisting of approximately 706 residential units and $142 million investment. Any questions on Har Harlem Walnut? Hearing none, I'll move on to the Arena District. Uh, this legislation will, will allow other department directors within the city to execute subsequent agreements. So, such as design reimbursement, construction reimbursement agreements, uh, with nationwide investments for public improvements uh, projects in the district. So we're, um, the subsequent agreements memorialize the actual cost associated with the specific phases of the public improvement projects, things like design, construction, and are the basis for the TIF reimbursements once a project is completed by nationwide investments. For example, a construction project bids out and inspected by public service and administered by nationwide investments will be governed by a construction reimbursement agreement that will provide for a final accounting of the project costs that are sub subsequently reimbursed from TIF, TIF funds. So in that case, the director of public service would need to enter into that construction reimbursement agreement. So that's what this legislation will do with regards to the Arena District TIF. Any questions on that? Just that I know that we had a comment online, you know, how to, because of the, of the TIF requirements under the ORC to be a blighted area. What was the reason again that the Arena District is considered a blighted area? So this TIF was created, there are some areas within the Arena District that still uh, have some areas that can be redeveloped and, and fall under the uh, revised code um, characteristics of slum and blight. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, with regards to the Wyland 40C TIF, the Wyland 40C TIF was created in 2010 to fund public improvements. A subsequent agreement was executed with Wyland Park Development in 2013 for use of those rev uh, revenues. An affiliate of Wyland Park Development is proposing a 311 unit apartment complex with a 557 space garage 
that will include 189 public parking spaces. The Wyland 40C TIF will be amended to update the list of public improvements to include these public parking facilities. A separate ordinance authorizing the TIF cooperative agreement will direct use of the TIF uh, revenue to reimburse payment of the bonds that are financing this public parking spaces. Uh, this is a, a need in the community to create more parking and happy to work with the developer in the area who's going to uh, create that structured parking and offer those spaces that are available to the public. And then the last project we'll be bringing before council is with regards to the, what we call the PNC Gilbert buildings and the Madison White Haynes buildings and the TIF we're doing there. We'll uh, move forward legislation that will authorize a TIF and cooperative agreement with affiliates of the Edwards companies that will provide funding sources for public infrastructure improvements associated with the redevelopment or renovation of these four properties. The PNC Tower is a $63 million investment that will have 195,000 square feet of commercial office and 180,000 square feet of residential. The Gilbert Building is a $36 million investment with 164 residential units and a 244 space parking garage. The Madison's White Hain Building uh, is a $14 million investment with 45 residential units. And the 98 North High Street uh, Building is a $31 million investment, 152 residential units and a parking garage. TIF revenues will pay for a sunken garden park in front of the PNC Plaza, improvement and expansion of the elevated pedestrian walkway over East Capitol Street, street streetscape improvements, public parking spaces, and other public improvements in support of the Madison White Haines and 98 North High Street developments. The benefits of these TIFs are as follows. The project will help the city's goal to increase the stock of affordable housing by providing 72 new affordable housing units to the market. Uh, 28 at 70% AMI, 30 at 80% AMI, and 14 at 100% AMI. And it will provide 195,000 square feet of commercial office space to the downtown office market that will be redeveloped and, and enhanced in the PNC Tower. Uh, those are all a summary of all the legislation pieces we'll be bringing forth in December. Uh, I do want to thank, uh, Council Member, I want to thank you and your team for your work in, in helping us as we move this legislation forward. I also want to thank Mark Lundeen, Michelle Larson, and Seth Brem um, on the development team and economic development for all the work they've done to uh, coordinate with the, the developer partners to have this important work continue in our community. Thank you very much, Director. I think that last project is um, particularly exciting as we try to envision what a lot of this the office building stock downtown could become. and, and so. Having these, uh, this project in particular, which is going to be an adaptive reuse of the, of the existing building, which it doesn't quite meet today's standards for Class A built office space, but certainly a place that, a building that was created that can now become residential and, and serve as you know, some office space and multi-use function uh, with that garden out front. That, I'm excited to watch how that, that evolves. So. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point, Chair Remy. As uh, we move forward in economic development uh, post-pandemic, uh, how we encourage mixed-use development to encourage not only uh, the office use and, and areas for continued in, in, increased jobs in our community, but the, uh, the residential component in that, uh, I think, will be a successful way for that re uh, adaptive reuse in some of our downtown buildings. And particularly the affordable housing component too, which is a, you know a highlight uh, of that that project. So, uh, thank you for your um, ex explanation of those tiffs. Um, I don't have any further questions at this time, and and so um, we and we don't have any speakers this evening. So, might as well move right into closing. Short and. Uh, very informative though so i thank you again for that presentation before we bring it to close i'd also like to thank the viewers for tu tuning in and for the community for their com uh, continued engagement and feedback i do want to thank mark carter again and the ctv team for assisting with our technology needs and connecting us with the community i also want to thank director stevens hannah reed mark lundeen quentin harris and the economic development team all of them for helping us prepare for this hearing um, I do want to um, thank um, Andrew Dyer with the Office of Legislative Research and, of course, my team, Jeffrey Carter and Lucy Frank, and their efforts for preparing us for this, this hearing this afternoon. So have a great evening and afternoon, everyone.
Thank you for tuning in and uh, we will continue working towards uh, bettering the city. Good night. Thanks again for doing that.